Linda is an endorsed midwife. She's a registered nurse and an international board certified lactation consultant with over 35 years of clinical experience. She is currently working as a clinical midwife consultant role on the south coast of New South Wales, Australia. And we're hoping in about June she will be submitting her PhD thesis through the Australian Catholic University, hoping to improve the experience for women birthing by cesarean section. Her interests include skin-to-skin, -skin, lactation education, breastfeeding support, women-centred and midwifery-led care, and the roles of feminism within maternity care. Linda values and enjoys presenting education for all staff, pregnant women, and breastfeeding women to ensure consistent and evidence-based care is provided to women. She hopes to continue her career with a clinical research and education focus and being a virtual international day, the midwife facilitator and presenter is a wonderful opportunity to support midwives around the world. So over to you now, Linda, just let me know when you want the slides moved. Lovely. Thank you very much. And thank you for coming, everybody. It's nice to see that there's a range of people there, mostly this side of the world, which is okay. Other people can listen into the recording. Um, yet my presentation today is about understanding birth trauma from the perspective of obstetric neglect. And um, I'm very excited to be presenting here again for VIDM in 2024. Uh, next slide, please. So I'm Linda Days. I live in Nowra, which is on the New South Wales south coast, and that's on the durable land of the UN Nation. You can see the, our beautiful Shoalhaven River there. Our hospital overlooks this river. It's a beautiful place to live and work. And I'd like to acknowledge the lands on which I'm presenting today as well, because this, um, there has been babies born on this land to... Um, Aboriginal people for many, many, many thousands of years. So this is a really special place. We've got special birthing trees right near our hospital. It's a great place to be. So in Australia, we have around 300,000 births every year. About 38% of those are birthing by caesarean section. And I'm sure all of you will be thinking now about the stats that you know for the countries that you work from too. And we know that caesarean rates are increasing worldwide. So this isn't just happening in Australia. Um, and World Health Organization states that any, you know, up to 19% may be reducing maternal and neonatal mortality. But we are edging way over that and continuing to increase. The other thing from this is that around one third of women experience birth trauma in Australia as well. And that is a, um, a significant thing for women who are birthing. In uh, um, New South Wales, we have a birth trauma inquiry that is happening currently. It, a select committee was established in June last year and there's been hearings around the state with um, women, consumer advocacy groups and healthcare providers all um, providing stories, sharing what they have experienced. And it's been a, a huge thing and a very eye-opening thing, I think, for many people to know how many women have been traumatised. Next slide, thank you. So understanding birth trauma is difficult. You know, people often get pushed aside when they say, well, you, you look okay. So it can be a physical trauma and it could be a psychological trauma, could be both, and both of them are equally important. It's associated with increasing interventions such as caesarean section, and I will focus a lot on caesarean section today as this is part of my PhD research, but other things that we do to women, inductions, doing forceps, things like that, all of these things increase birth trauma. And it's really hard to identify normal. So when do we say that a woman has no risk? The only time we can say that is when it's in the past, it's in hindsight. So we assume that every woman has a risk when they're pregnant and they're often treated as much higher risk than what they really are. Maternal choice is not considered in many birthing scenarios either. So babies have become the most important person within that um, dyad and um, given their own identity um, and often at the, the risk of women being pushed aside and their choices, their wishes not being heard. 
Next slide. Thank you. And this one way, one way is very much often the, the way of the healthcare provider or facility. Um, so obstetric violence, when you think of that, you think brutal, purposeful, violent things happening to women. And I would not think that any midwives, doctors or other maternity care providers go to work intending to cause harm or to assault the women in their care, but care can be violent. Um, you know, sometimes these are really um, covert practices that are causing similar psychological harm, but they're less acknowledged and more likely to be disregarded. And, you know, when the focus is placed on the baby and not on the woman, it increases those risks. Now, the World, World Health Organization definition of obstetric violence says, I'm going to read this out, outright physical abuse, profound humiliation and verbal abuse, coercive or unconsented medical procedures, including sterilization, lack of confidentiality, failure to get fully informed consent, refusal to give pain medication, gross violations of privacy, refusal of admission to health facilities, neglecting women during childbirth to suffer life-threatening avoidable complications. So that's a pretty broad thing and it does cover all of these issues. And this presentation is going to show that separating women from their well baby at cesarean section birth can cause long-lasting birth trauma. And I also want to introduce this novel consideration of obstetric neglect. And we'll talk more about that as we go on. Thank you. Next slide. So my, the title of my research is Where's My Baby? And that came about because of the women that I interviewed for this um, study, that this was said a lot. So women were asking, where is my baby? They didn't know where they were most of the time. So it is my PhD research and it was done to understand the experience of women who were separated from their well baby at cesarean section. So well mother, well baby. I used a feminist phenomenological framework and I viewed the data through birthing theories, feminist birthing theories, birth territory by Faye and Parrott and childbirth as a rite of passage by Reid. Um, and it was done in Australia. The women had all birthed in Australia um, from all over Australia. They had birthed in various or had laboured and had their care, their antenatal care through various services. Um, and they had all been separated from their baby without medical reasons in the 10 years prior to my um, to being interviewed. So um, there were some that were only a few months after birth and some that were 10 years down the track. Now, both of these theories really highlight woman-centred care and the influence of those who are caring for the woman and the environment she's birthing in. So that's why I chose the two of them. Um, it's really about limiting the woman's power and control over her own body in particular. And if you think about a woman having a cesarean section, we um, put her on the bed. She um, is immobilised because we give her anaesthetics and we tie down her arms often by, by adding things like blood pressure cuffs and IV things. And then um, we take, if we take her baby away from her, she can't do anything about it baby's gone she can voice it if she feels strong enough to say that she wants her baby to stay but we can still take that baby from her um, and when we um, reduce a woman's power and control it increases fear there's poorer outcomes and it reduces birth satisfaction and the woman's right to being in control of her own body, to having bodily autonomy doesn't change with her birth mode. So whether it's a vaginal birth or a cesarean birth, she still have those um, rights and it should reflect human rights. And um, if you are very interested about the theories, there's a little bit more about this in um, my 2023 presentation. And there's also a paper going to be published on the methodology um, in the British Journal of Midwifery later this month. Next slide, thank you. So the overarching themes of um, the study, so were, there were four main themes here that you can see. Isolating that maternal experience of separation was very challenging in the interview process. So there were very long emotional interviews um, stories of very distressing and traumatic perinatal care that included pregnancy, labour and birth and postnatal. Um, the women were very 
emotional through all of it. And you can see that one of those themes was emotional turmoil. And the four main themes really characterise the experience of having their well baby taken away from them without having a medical reason. Disconnection sub-themes were um, desire to hold baby, and that was really strong, and that is really evident in the literature as well, that women want to be able to hold their baby when they're first born. They want to count their fingers and toes. They want to look at them. They want to know that they're safe and that they're alive. And there were women in this study who did not know that their babies were alive. The fear of um, the birth and then a baby perhaps not crying, they thought their babies had already died separation and that was you know that babies were removed within the room initially and then out of the room taken to another place there was no skin to skin and none of the women were given skin to skin and breastfeeding and the impacts on breastfeeding from all of this Emotional turmoil, the sub-themes for that were emotions at the birth and since the birth. And there was quite a change between those. It went from um, very fearful and um, experiences when it first was happening to being very angry and um, guilty as well for having lost that connection with their baby. And also the impact on relationships with both the baby and the partner and they had been quite significant and for the women who had had future births and had had the experience of having skin to skin and not being separated from their baby they really found the experience very different and quite guilty about the fact that they parented their babies differently because they had a different relationship and also with the partners it had been quite devastating on how they um, still remained with their partners how that affected um, how they work together as a parenting team. And then insight. And the sub-themes for this were mother's knowledge. And these mothers were not silly. So all of the women in this study were well-educated women. They had all sought lots of information before they'd had their birth. They'd been to birthing classes. They'd done lots of training to prepare for labour and birth. And even for the ones who had planned caesarean sections, they were still doing lots of preparation to make things the right way for them. Um, interventions was another sub-theme. Um, and that was, again, from pregnancy, labour and birth right through. And then the partner. And while the partner wasn't really looked at significantly in this study, there was um, very clearly they were very impacted by the separation as well, not just from the baby, but being separated from their wife as well. And then the next birth. And these women were planning hard. Some of them, when they had gone on to have better births, um, had such great experiences. But some of them also were separated again, even though they'd done lots and lots and lots of planning. And the women really chose to be part of this study because they wanted to improve outcomes for future birthing women. Sometimes that was them, but sometimes that was going to be other women out in the community as well. So they were very proactive in what they were doing. Next slide, please. So what I really want to talk to you about today is the final um, theme here, and that's influence. And influence is about is, was understanding the impact of healthcare providers. So the sub-themes of this one was power and control, what impact the, the people, the staff caring for them um, had on power and control, maternal choice and consent, coercion, and staff actions. Next slide, please. So power and control, the first sub-theme, and I think most of us who are working in maternity care have heard these terms used quite a lot. Who has power and control in the room? And the um, birth territory theory really shows the importance of the person who um, has control is the one that has the better experience. And even if you're a really kind caregiver and you're doing the right thing for the women that you think, if you don't let the woman have control over her own body, she's still going to get a poor experience. And the participants in this study really recognised the power imbalance of their entire perinatal experience, including the birth. One of the participants said, basically, I disappeared the moment I set foot in the hospital. They talked of their vulnerability, disappearing, not being valued, and the agendas of the healthcare facility and the care providers were prioritised over the needs or wishes of the women. 
And these stories showed not just that hospitals were busy or that they were short-staffed, while these were sometimes some of the cases, and we all know times that we don't work to our best because we are short-staffed and we're working really hard. But um, one of the participants said, I just feel like women are so vulnerable and it sometimes feels like we get preyed upon for a convenience or for an opinion at a particular time when you're even more vulnerable. And they really felt that this contributed to the situation which created the separation of them from their baby. So whether they were going to have a caesarean section, when they were going to have the caesarean section, who was present and of having no control. Next slide, please. So maternal choice and consent was the next theme. And really there was no choice most of, for most of these women. Um, even the ones that had such really in-depth birth plans um, for their second time round, so their second experience after having the birth separation, they still knew that there were some things they should be fighting for and some things that weren't worth fighting for. So that was, you know, they really didn't think they were going to get everything. Um, it was very dismissive of their wishes and it wasn't seen as a priority. Women were not included in decision-making often and they were just expected to comply. A lot of them talked about being a good girl and they felt that things like antenatal classes prepared them of how to behave going into a healthcare facility rather than empowering them. Um, Partners were often asked to um, answer questions for their wives. They were asked to convince their partners to have a caesarean section as well. And this choice and consent was evidence across all stages of perinatal care. So from, you know, in the antenatal period when they were choosing to um, have births, but also right up to being able to have skin to skin with their baby. And consent was another really big thing. So everyone signed a consent form. So they had a cesarean section, they signed a consent form. Um, but participants agreed to things without really understanding the risks, benefits or consequences in the moment, which ultimately led to them being separated from their baby. And one participant said, unless someone tells you you've got a choice, you just do what people tell you to do. And another one said, I was given a choice, but it felt like a very pressured choice. And the, the words of, you know, um, dead babies and things like that was used. These women talked about this quite a lot. And I know we have all heard this used and we all hate the fact that it's used, but it is still being used. One more click, please and consented versus seeking consent and just it's the language of that so how often do you hear someone say that they consented the woman what does that mean is it you know they're doing it rather than asking permission and actually seeking consent to the procedure and sometimes procedures are done in in a rush and it's done being done very quickly but we should always be still stopping and listening to what the woman has to say and whether she agrees with what we're doing with her with her body. Next slide. So coercion was the, the final um, sub-theme on here. And women used this word coerced a lot in the interview. So they described the experience of being coerced to consent to how and when the baby would be born. So um, that may be because everyone wanted to go home, that it was going to be inconvenient for the middle of the night. They weren't given time to continue to labour and it was going to have to be a caesarean section. So they signed those consent forms but really didn't feel like there was any choice choice to that it was just a ticker box risk was definitely escalated to obtain consent and that was in pregnancy for women who were wanting to have a VBAC and not very many of them were successful in getting permission to have a VBAC um, and then of those some of them ended up again with having another cesarean section and for some being separated again the participants really felt like they were bullied into making those decisions um, and that led to their well baby being taken away from them yet again. One of the participants said they were so coercive, they still kind of called the shots even though we were the ones that made the decisions. Next slide, thank you. Staff actions. Now this is us. So 
the data from this sub-theme included multiple maternity care providers, so midwives, obstetricians, anaesthetists, operating room nurses, everyone that was really caring for this woman. There were some positive encounters, so it wasn't all bad, 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 but again, some of them, uh, most of them were negative. But even the, the positive encounters, one of the women said that the anaesthetist held her hand when something was happening with the birth of her baby. And that was the thing that stopped her spiraling down into what she thought she would have had was PTSD. There was also staff in the opera in the recovery room who were trying to support the woman, this one woman who was separated from her baby for six hours after birth in the recovery room. Every time they were actively asking and trying to get her back to her baby, but she still didn't feel like they understood the urgency behind it. The interactions included those threats of harm or death to the baby if the woman didn't comply, but most of them realised in hindsight that they were really unfounded, that their babies came out, all these babies had APGARs of nine and nine and were breathing, screaming, happy when they were born. Um, and even the debriefing and complaints processes for women, so these were generally um, trying to avoid litigation most of the time. So they were indifferent to the experience of the woman. They trivialised the events, at least your baby's okay. They denied culpability. So we're sorry you feel that way, but taking no res um, responsibility for causing those feelings and stopping them basically getting sued as well. Um, and women were choosing care providers to have continuity of care. So there was a number of these women chose private care providers because they thought they would have continuity. And we know that that's good. We, we've heard a lot about that today already. Um, and one participant said, so when you're first two-time parents and you hear, if you don't do this, your baby's going to die, like what do you do? I wasn't spoken to. I wasn't told anything. I wasn't asked anything. So that dead baby card was used very frequently. Some women took their debriefing and complaints processes much higher than the provider or the hospital, um, but still didn't get a great deal of response from that. Um, one debrief, and I know um, in Australia there's a lot about debriefing um, and how it's done, who should be doing it, are we trying to do it? And one debrief that the woman said was his debrief was limited to, I guess, the CTG. And he basically came in, rolled it across the bed and said, look at that, that's massive. You're all good now though, right? All right, see ya. And that was it. Next slide, please. I feel like we've gone backwards. We should be up to slide 20, I think. Yep, perfect. <laughs> That's it. Great. So obstetric neglect. And obstetric is not, we're not here to bag out the obstetricians. So obstetric means relating to the care and treatment of women in pregnancy, childbirth, and the postnatal period. So we're not choosing one um, group of people over another here. So obstetric neglect is failure to provide appropriate care. So non-consensual, disrespectful, violating. It's more than mistreatment. And both birth trauma and obstetric violence, as I talked about before, are really associated with the physical, which can discredit the psychological trauma that some women experience. Obstetric neglect really disempowers the woman. So it voids her choices about how she births and where she births. Um, it voids her um, consent. It influences how she gives consent and coerces her compliance to procedures. And it neglects the woman as being the epicentre of the perinatal care and impacts her future mental health and relationships. And this is really important when we're thinking about communities. It's not just about the baby. This is ongoing in their families, their relationships, whether they have more children, how those children are raised, and then those children are going on to have children one day as well. Next slide, please. So human rights and women's human rights, women have the right to safe, respectful and supportive perinatal care. And this is, you know, when we think of all the code of ethics for midwives, this is what we say we do. And it gives, includes 
being given choice about what happens to their body and to their baby, however they birth. And it's their body and their baby. They should be making those choices. Thank you. Next slide. So I want you to think about the answer here and um, you, know, you can maybe even type some things in the chat here. What do you think is the answer? How can we protect women? How can we ensure that they are the ones that are in control of their own birth? How do we make sure they um, have choices over what they do, that they're getting informed consent? There might be some questions at the end as well. Next slide, please. So I think midwives, midwives and woman-centred care, this is what we learn. This is our bread and butter. We train and all our values align with woman-centred care practices for all births. And midwives are there at caesarean sections. We don't just drop them off at the operating room doors and run away. We stay there with them and we go in and support women as they're having their babies. And really, we're not there to do anything else. We're there for the woman and for her baby. At caesarean section, women are very vulnerable and midwives need to partner with, protect, support and advocate for birthing women just to try and help reset that balance of power so that it's a little bit more even. It is difficult in that um, environment of the operating theatre for women to feel like they are completely in control. And often things are being done quickly as well, but we need to be able to balance that power. Traumatised women impact family and societal well-being. It changes how our communities experience birth and mothering. Women talk to each other. They tell their stories so that the next woman goes into hospital already feeling fearful. But if we have empowered women, we ensure strong family and community futures. And if we don't put women at the centre of everything that we do, we cause psychological harm and trauma. And obstetric neglect doesn't consider the rights or needs of the woman but uses power, control and coercion to needs, meet the needs of the facility or the care provider. And keeping mothers and babies in close physical contact after birth needs to become usual practice. This is what helps keep women grounded. This helps them become mothers to transition from a pregnant woman to being a mother. And it shouldn't be exceptional. It shouldn't be something that's really special and that women say, I was allowed to stay with my baby. And that's what women are talking about. Are they allowed to do certain things? This is their birth, their baby. And there's just a final quote that I'd like to finish with, which I thought was a very poignant one from one of the women. And it says, you know, women shouldn't have to fight for their respectful maternity care. And fighting is what a lot of them have been doing. And some of them are doing it through becoming participants in research studies and things like that. They want their voices heard. But let's go back to being really respectful midwives and give them power and control. And I think that's probably all for me. It's really about changing the culture and the way that we work. And, you know, we have very led obstet obstetric-led services. We need to move them to being woman-centred.